Um, so if I may, um, uh, Stefania, if you are in the background, if uh, you can join us on the screen. Um, so it's a, a delight to see you. So Stefania is a consultant cardiologist at King's College Hospital in London. Um, she's an expert in cardiac MRI and indeed has lots of experience in cardiac MRI and amyloidosis in, in inherited conditions more broadly. Um, so it's, it's an absolute pleasure to see you, Stefania, and please take the floor for your talk. Thank you, and that's a very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here today and wanted to thank uh, um, Rachel for the opportunity. Um, can you see my screen? No, we can't just yet. If you can share your slides, that would be super helpful. OK, sorry. So just while Stefania is uh, doing that, uh, she's actually going to take us through. We have a couple of cases, actually, one of which uh, Steffi will present and then the other that Lynn will. Um, and uh, I um, I've no doubt yeah. it's going to be an interesting case that will highlight further points. We can now. Thank you very much. Oh, Stefania. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. Um, OK, so it's happening. Um, we are presenting a case of a 27 years old lady. She has uh, no past medical history of note. She's no diabetes, hypertension, no hypercholesterolemia. She smokes 10 cigarettes per day and cannabis once a month. She works as a support worker. She reports no family history of cardiomyopathies or sudden cardiac death. In her father, um, she says, has got uh, ischemic heart disease, but no other condition running in the family. She is not on any regular medication and has never received a COVID vaccination uh, or a recent vaccination. She presents at the um, local ED department beginning on November 2021 with palpitation, shortness of breath and chastiness after smoking cannabis. There is an episode of vomiting associated with this, but she is afebrile and she has no flu-like symptoms. Her ECG locally shows a steel elevation in the inferolateral leads. She is therefore transferred urgently to King's Cath Lab in the suspicion of an acute coronary syndrome. Unfortunately, we don't have the ECG at the time. An invasive angio shows normal, smooth, and obstructive coronaries. This is a, one of the ECGs with us that actually shows a more diffuse ST elevation in the anterolateral and inferior leads. A troponin is significantly elevated locally, peaks at 5,000, peak at 7,500 with us. Hemoglobin is normal. She has a normal white cell count, in particular a normal eosinophilic count throughout the admission with us normal renal function, liver, thyroid function, and bone profile. Her CRP is only mildly borderline raised with a normal ESR and ferritin. There are elevated CK, 4,500, and also an elevated NT per BMP, 2,600. We ran an extensive viral screen, and this was negative, including COVID-19 RNA. Here is the transthoracic echo. Um, sorry, I, I forgot to say I'm um, presenting this case alongside Elise, our nurse, ICC nurse, and uh, um, she is telling me that she's unable to present and unable to be seen. OK, give us one second and we'll see if we can um, see what's going on on the technical side. Thank you. Thank you. So here, yeah, um, let's go back to the echo. Here is the transthoracic echo. We can see a global, moderately impaired LV function, was more pronounced uh, hypokinesia at the septum and at the inferior walls. At this point, a cardiac MRI is requested, query myocarditis. The morning after the admission, I get a call from the cardiology reg warning that there is a, a lady on the ward. Um, her uh, um, blood screen in terms of, of query myocarditis shows a, a negative autoimmune panel, negative rheumatoid factor in her screen, cardiac muscle antibodies, um, 
um, inflammatory cytokines are also no normal, uh, except for a raised vascular endothelial growth factor that is seen in relation to heart failure. Angiotensin converting enzyme is also normal. Whilst on CCU, um, she is hypotensive with a blood pressure systolic between 80 and 90 millimeter mercury, and uh, um, runs of non sustained BT are documented uh, on uh, um, the telemetry. Here we bring her for the MRI day after admission. Here are some extra cardiac images. We see a high BMI but uh, no pathological axillary or mediastinal lymph nodes, uh, no pathological lung uh, masses or, ish, or um, changes. In the images, yeah, three lung axes, again show um, globally moderately impaired function. The ventricle, left ventricle is non-dilated. There is possible more pronounced hypokinesia, the mid inferolateral um, basal inferior wall and septum. LV function is uh, moderately impaired, 37%. RV Oh, I think we have temporarily uh, kicked uh, Stefania out. <laughs> I suspect it's the images that are kind of causing an issue, so I'm sure she'll die back in. Um, just in the meantime, perhaps, um, Liz, I'm so sorry for not introducing you before. Um, um, perhaps you'd like to just introduce yourself whilst we wait for, wait for Stefania to dial back in. Are you able to unmute Thanks. and... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've slipped in there, haven't I? Thank you very much for having me. Um, I My name's Liz. I am the lead nurse for the Inherited Cardiac Condition Service at King's College Hospital and Guy's and St. Thomas's. Um, and this was a, a shared patient uh, between Steffi and myself. So I will be just occasionally dipping into the slides, but the majority of this presentation is Steffi. So I very much hope that she is able to get back to us um, to carry on. I'm not sure I can carry it alone. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Are there any bits that you'd like to add just this so far from the case that she's highlighted? Are there any points that um, you would wanted to add from the history or from any elements that you came across? Across uh, so, in that first uh, presentation stage? Yes, yeah, so we've done it chronologically. And actually, the, the, the flow of that was to sort of represent the points where the inherited cardiac conditions uh, service is um, sort of the touch points with patients when, when they first present. Um, so actually, I'm not on the scene yet in terms of the original images. And actually, it's very interesting when we look at other presentations um, in regards to myocarditis, for example. Um, in, in terms of when ICC come onto the scene um, for patients like this. So it would be difficult to comment too much because I'll, I'll ruin the presentation, but we'll see if, if Steffi can't come back, then I'm more than happy to continue on um, in terms of my involvement with the case, no problem. Perfect. I think we're just waiting for her actually just to, to join at the moment. Ooh. Okay. Any tech crew in the background? Any ideas whether Steffi is able to join us back or has her internet gone down? It looks, like I, it looks like she's not quite been able to join. I've been trying to request her to as well, just in case she were having any issues on the other end. But unfortunately, it's not working. Well, I wonder me? if, should, should we ask um, Lynn to present first? Exactly. And that gives her a bit of a chance to um, hopefully join and, and we could pick back up or even start again. Yeah, I think that's a great Sounds idea. Sounds good. Hello, Lovely. everyone. Hi, Lynn. Um, Lynn, it's my pleasure to present you today. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, a great colleague and a friend, Dr. Lynn Miller, who is currently a positive fellow in inherited cardiac conditions at Guy's St. Thomas Hospital. And she's also subspecialized on advanced uh, imaging. Uh, so, Lynn, you have an extremely interesting case, as far as I know, and uh, we're all looking forward to, to listen to this. Yes. And brainstorming um, about. Yeah, I'll just put on to, can you confirm that it's in presenter mode? 
Yes, yes, we can see it absolutely fine. Yes, in presenter mode. Okay, yes. Uh, thanks um, to the team today uh, for inviting me to give this case presentation. And yes, it's great to see you, Demetra. Um, uh, yeah, today. So I'm just going to uh, go on and head and present. This was a 53 year old gentleman uh, of uh, Caribbean descent. He originally presented back in 2014 to the cardiology services, having had some palpitations and pre syncope and breathlessness while playing five aside football, which at that stage he was doing around twice per week. His past medical history included uh, having had a recent diagnos diagnosis of a left super superior femoral artery stenosis. Uh, he was being complaining of intermittent claudication and was found to have an 85% stenosis in the just below the mid thigh. He was also hypercholesterolemic and had been advised to start a statin for this. He had five siblings and of note, his mother had coronary artery disease. He was an ex-smoker and had given up some years before in the early 2000s. He worked in an office-based job and was on aspirin and uh, torvastatin for his um, vascular issues. So when he was seen um, at the clinic was the initial referral, he looked well. His blood pressure was a little bit borderline, 144.89, with a heart rate of 71, sat to be 88. Uh, on room air, respiratory at 12. His BMI was just above the normal range of 27. Uh, chest was clear and uh, cardiovascular examination was essentially unremarkable. Now, just uh, unfortunately, I was unable to get the original ECG, but it was quite well documented in the clinic letter. It showed he was in sinus rhythm at 60 beats per minute. Uh, there was a narrow QRS complex with a normal PR interval uh, and some lateral T wave inversions V5 and V6 with flat T waves uh, in one and AVL. And because he had had these symptoms during exercise, the GP had kindly arranged for him to have halter at prior to clinic. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the results of this, but it was documented in the letter that uh, this showed sinus rhythm with runs of sinus tachycardia, and he managed to wear it during exercise. So the sinus tachycardia correlated when he'd been doing uh, exercise. And just some isolated ventricular topics. And a decision at that stage, just in light of his cardiovascular risk factors, is whether to go on and uh, ha exclude coronary artery disease with a, a baseline transthoracic echo and then a stress echocardiogram. Uh, I think they felt it was quite reassuring the in initial halter. So, um, just move on. Sorry, uh, slides are not moving on. Oh, yes. OK. So, this is his baseline uh, transthoracic. Um, and this had been reported as normal, uh, showing good LV function. I appreciate the images aren't perfect, but you can see um, preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, the, uh, on, I suppose on hindsight, you might question whether there was a little bit of um, left ventricular hypertrophy at this stage. And then he went on to have a stress echo. Uh, just let that play. So the rest images at the top and the, and the stress images at the bottom um, showing uh, good contractile reserve with dobutamine stress echo uh, and no inducible regional wall motion abnormalities. So he was then seen in clinic. Uh, prior to clinic he'd also had an exercise tolerance test. Um, this showed he'd exercised for nearly 10 minutes on the Bruce protocol achieving 11.1 METs. The test terminated because of leg discomfort, probably in keeping with his claudication. He did not experience any chest pain uh, and there was no arrhythmias documented. There was a good heart rate response, achieving 96% of his target heart rate. Uh, there was a slight blunted blood pressure response, but otherwise this was unremarkable. But when he was seen in clinic, it, it, he was still complaining of palpitations and shortness of breath on exertion. And just to be 100% sure that he didn't have coronary artery disease, he went on to have a CTCA that uh, showed no coronary artery disease and no calcification. And so he was discharged from clinic at that point as it was felt there was no cardiac cause for his symptoms. The next time he presented to medical services was back in 2018. Um, at that stage, he had been complaining of pins and needles in both hands and was refer referred to the local hand clinic, showing um, and his clinical features, history and examination were consistent with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. And this was um, confirmed on nerve conduction studies, showing moderate to severe carpal tunnel syndrome bilaterally. He had tried splints, um, but his symptoms were becoming um, worse and it was felt that conservative management wasn't going to be enough. So 
Uh, he then saw the, um, the surgeons who noted a positive Tinel sign on the right side with a, a degree of wasting of spinal eminence. So he went on to have a right carpal tunnel decompression. So the next time he presents is in the summer of 2020, uh, where he presents to the emergency department um, with a two to three day history of chest tightness that had been intermittent. His ECG at this stage was noted, uh, again, apologies for not having this. I, I did try quite hard, but uh, it was during the pandemic and I'm not sure whether I was able to, to uh, obtain it. Um, it showed he had a first degree AV block, um, but with this fixed ST elevation in V2 to V4, and the T-wave inversions laterally that had been noted in this clinic appointment in 2014. He had serial troponins in the emergency department that were static at 48. And given it was kind of peak COVID time, he didn't want to say as an inpatient, he was quite well um, and his symptoms had subsided. So he was discharged for outpatient follow-up. So prior to his clinic appointment, he had arranged to have a halter monitor um, just to show you the report here. They showed um, sinus rhythm uh, and confirmed this first degree AV block, which you can see on the little uh, excerpt below. Um, there was a kind of borderline QRS um, duration, which you can see some fractionation uh, below uh, and a few ectopics as noted. But otherwise, his heart rate was in sinus rhythm, um, 54 to 154 beats per minute with a mean of 72. Um, he did comment when he was seen at clinic that the palpitations, um, he didn't have any of the symptoms, as patients often say when they wear their halter monitor. So this um, was repeated and he was referred for a cardiac MRI um, just to, to ensure that he had a structurally normal heart. So the second halter was quite different and this showed he was having episodes of wanky back followed by periods of two to one. Uh, and also having some broad complex tachycardia, which I'll show. So these are some of the um, sort of traces. You can see the two to one, which then uh, goes into a uh, broad complex tachycardia uh, that terminates with two to one and more uh, couplets and ectopy. So this is his cardiac MRI that was performed. You can see that there's uh, left intracular hypertrophy, uh, probably of all, uh, not just of the uh, septum, but you can see it's more marked in the septum with an intraventricular septum measurement of 18 millimetres. There's just long axis function, some posterior directed mitral regurgitation. And, and you can see on the um, Luke Locker sequences and on the late GAD imaging, uh, quite significant uh, late enhancement. Um, both transmural, subendocardial, but in a non-coronary artery distribution. So, uh, and the ability, uh, inability to null the myocardium. So I apologize, this is a slightly unorthodox uh, color map. Uh, we had some issues getting it off the uh, MRI machine, but you can see that if you look at the scale, that there's a prolonged uh, native T1 uh, uh, of one, three, two, uh, five, two milliseconds, with a high ECV of 44%. And this was consistent with the diagnosis of cardiac amyloid. And in light of um, the history and the uh, arrhythmia, he was referred for a dual chamber ICD, which he went on to have, on, uh, which was uncomplicated. So then he represents in early 2022 uh, to the emergency department with heart failure symptoms. He was quite clinically overloaded at that stage. His blood pressure was 169 over 139, quite a high BMP of nearly 3000. His chest x-ray showed bilateral pleural effusions and his ECG showing an A-sensed V-paced rhythm. Um, and so he was admitted from the emergency department for offloading. Uh, just to show his ECG showing an, an A-sense uh, VPS rhythm. So this is, I just let those play. Um, you can see very classical kind of um, speckling of the myocardium, uh, severe LV impairment, thickening of um, the valves, you can see on the mitral and aortic and tricuspid valve. You could note the um, large pleural effusion um, and the uh, you can see on the right side of the heart, there's RV uh, hypertrophy as well. Uh, and you note that the device in the RV apex. So prior to discharge, it was felt why did we uh, just the diagnosis had been established. So he went on to have a DPD scan whilst as an inpatient um, and uh, 
uh, Mariana had talked through this earlier on, but you can see uh, the quite marked uptick um, in the heart. Uh, so this is a perigene grade two. However, you can see that you can still see the outline of the skeletal muscle and, and just to, to show this is from um, a paper showing the, the differences. So our patient was high grade uh, perigene two um, compared to the three where you kind of lose the, the skeletal outline. Uh, so during this admission, he offloaded really well and um, he was seen by the heart failure nurses and referred for community heart failure follow up uh, and was discharged on good heart failure therapy as outlined. And at that stage, he was referred for local follow up um, to our centre, but also to the National Amyloid Centre for further management. So, um, sorry, these just take a second to play. Um, you can see this was only after a month of uh, heart failure therapy, uh, although there's still quite um, you know, there's LV impairment and you can see very reduced long axis function. There actually have been reasonable improvement in his overall LV function. Um, and you can see nicely um, the reduced long axis function on the TDI imaging, as well as the kind of classical bullseye showing um, apical sparing uh, strain pattern. So he was then uh, went on to be seen at the National Amyloid Centre, um, and this is after being sort of seeing the community heart failure nurses in the at home. He was doing quite well. His six minute walk test was six to one um, uh, meter, so that is 118 percent predicted, and there was no evidence um, of uh, plasma cell dyscrasia, so not in keeping with AL amyloid. Uh, SAP scan uh, did al also did not show any. Um, visceral amyloid deposits. Uh, clinically, he was complaining uh, constipation, but no overt features of uh, other aspects of autonomic dysfunction. And at this stage, he was felt to be a candidate for genetic testing. So his genetics uh, came back and showed that he was heterozygous for the I107V gene, which is like one of the slightly less common uh, genes, but does give both uh, neurological and cardiac manifestations of the condition. So at this stage, he was referred in light of his uh, carpal tunnel and, and also um, to see whether he'd be a candidate for targeted therapy such as batisserin. Uh, he was referred to a neurologist to see whether or not um, he could um, would be a candidate for this um, therapy. So this is he underwent um, a skin or intradermal nerve uh, fibre uh, biopsy that uh, with this is one of the kind of classic membership questions I always remember showing uh, Congo red stain and showing apple green uh, biofringence under polarised light. So this is not his specimen, but you can see uh, just on the stock image from a paper that classical apple green biofringence. And with immunohistochemistry staining, this was consistent with a, uh, the ATTR type of amyloid. So in light of the um, amyloid and um, peripheral neuropathy, um, PND stage one, he, he was considered a candidate for patisserin. Uh, so he then underwent a uh, follow up at uh, the National Amyloid Centre and had started on this therapy. He's been tolerating it very well. And this is a three weekly infusion, I believe. Um, but more recently has changed to vitisserin, which I, is a, a depot injection. And it just makes life a bit more practical. Um, yeah, so just leave it there and, and thank you for listening. I, I hope that's kind of it's a good example of uh, some of the things that Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Fontana was explaining earlier. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was brilliant. So again, another really eloquent case that just highlights uh, the, the learnings that uh, Mariana took us through earlier. Um, so thank you. So moving swiftly on, um, Stefania, I think you are now back in the background. She was booted out yeah. of the meeting, but she has rejoined us. Um, so Stefania, over okay. to yourself and uh, Liz again to take us through the final bits of your case. Thank you very much. It was. Uh... It was. I didn't understand. So it must have been the extra cardiac anatomy. Um, and so we were just uh, um, discussing a case, a young lady, 27, presents with palpitation, chest tightness, um, unobstructed coronaries, a significantly raised troponin and uh, um, impaired LV function on echo. Um, suspicion is a myocarditis and she gets on the MRI table for a cardiac MRI. No extra cardiac findings on note apart a high BMI. The, um, here, the long axis view, you, you um, shout if anything happens. So the cines aren't moving at the moment. 
Perfect. Uh, so yeah, again, a moderately impaired LV, um, LV cavity size is non-dilated. There is more pronounced akinesia at the mid-inferior uh, wall and septum. LVEF is 37%. RV um, is non-dilated with a mildly impaired global um, RVEF. Here is the short axis. Again, we can note it, um, there is a relative LVH. This is a young lady. Normally, we would expect visually um, um, thin walls. Again, there is a mid-inferolateral, mid more pronounced hypokinesia. Tissue characterization pre-contrast in order to look for uh, diffuse fibrosis in myocardial edema shows a diffused um, um, patchy rays um, T1 values. Here we can see at the inferior septum, inferior wall, anterior septum, um, row below, short axis, basal, mid, um, and apical. There are patchy areas where T1 is raised on the right hand side our normal T1 map would look like. For our patient, T1 values are significantly raised. Um, Diffusely. T2 mapping for edema are even more concerning. Sorry, I'm just aware that we have limited time. Um, T2 values are significantly raised throughout the myocardial walls, base, mid, and apical. Again, on the right, our normal T2 map would look like uh, our patient values are significantly raised throughout the ventricle with RV involvement. Post-contrast images are um, scary, meaning that there is diffuse, dense, uh, bright, uh, um, late announcement, subepicardia going mid-wall, uh, reaching transmurality in several areas. Here, the short taxis stuck where there is a circumferential dense late announcement from base to apical segment. Just out of curiosity, quantifying this was coming up to 70% of the myocardial mass. At this point, I try reaching for the interventional colleagues to organize an endomyocardial biopsy. My suspicions here are a giant cell myocarditis in view of the clinical presentation. She's hyper potensive with run of non-sustained VT also during the scan and these terrible MRI images. ALVC obviously comes in the differential for the typical ring-like pattern and sarcoid as a granulomatous inflammatory condition. Um, she is started on alpha medication and as the biopsy cannot happen um, the day of the CMR, um, IV methylpred is given as uh, inflammatory markers are negative and there is an extensive infective screen. We did discuss with the um, infectious disease and the rheumatology team at the time. A more in-depth analysis reveals that for eight days prior to the admission, she had been taking an unlicensed diet pill called Only Be Me Fat Buster Supplement that she had discovered on Snapchat. And this was together with a program of high physical exercise in someone who hadn't done exercise prior. She developed profound tiredness soon after starting the diet pills, followed by acute breathlessness, palpitation, chest tightening and dizziness, which is what brought her to seek for medical attention. The pills contain several ingredients, in particular Garcinia starch, aloe seeds, cassia seeds, lotus leaf. Garcinia cambogia is a tropical fruit and a popular weight loss supplement, and the FDA considers it unsafe due to risk of liver toxicity. Looking at the literature, we did find um, cases uh, described of acute necrotizing eosinophilic myocarditis in patients taking Garcinia. The endomyocardial biopsy um, happens the day after the MRI. It is successful. We get seven myocardial samples from the RV septum. And as we can remember, there was significant involvement on both T2 and LG maps, um, images. The biopsy shows a focal myocyte necrosis with occasional interstitial lymphocytes, but not reaching criteria for a lymphocytic myocarditis. There is minimal interstitial fibrosis. There are no giant cells, no eosinophils, and neutrophils, granuloma, no evidence of amyloid iron or storage deposition. In view of the severity of the MRI findings, we did get the biopsy reviewed by our colleagues at the Brompton.
She remains asymptomatic. Troponin is nicely down trending. She's discharged home on optimized diphelo medication and tapering oral steroids with a planned follow up appointment in three weeks in the myocarditis clinic and an outpatient CT pact. I am now, though now worried in view of the MRI to wait till three weeks and see her in clinic. So I give her a call a few days after and she reports that she has developed bilateral anterior uveitis and she's given topical steroids, which is weird because she was on high dose um, prednisolone at the time. She also again reports frequent palpitation. An urgent alter shows frequent polymorphic VEs with couplets, triplets, an episode of ventricular runs with the fastest at 210 bits per minute. I ask her to come back to hospital. She's loaded on amiodarone. She also got a CT PET then that shows no active extra cardiac sarcoid or large vessel vasculitis. There is a low um, diffuse grade of myocardial uptake in keeping with myocardial inflammation. Here is her ECG, just uh, um, nice to see that she has lost all potential in relation to the myocyte necrosis. At this point, the differential are of myocarditis, query cause, uh, we've seen a negative viral screen, autoimmune screen is also negative. There is a normal eosinophil count, and especially the endomyocardial biopsy is non-diagnostic. Also rules out giant cell myocarditis. In regards to sarcoid, there are no extra cardiac features on CMR and PET. There is a normal ACE. There's the lack of conduction disease that with such a florid involvement we would expect for sarcoid. ALVC, we do know that of phases um, arimogenic cardiomyopathy can present as off phases myocarditis, but I had never seen such a florid involvement, in particular the edema component. There's no evidence of fibrofatty replacement on the biopsy. The LG is obviously very suggestive in terms of the ring-like pattern. Um, I then refer to the inherited cardiology team for consideration of genetic testing. She unfortunately is a challenging patient. She's non-compliant with medication and discontinued her failure medication several times. She do comes for a um, follow-up um, CMR scans and we keep her under close observation. She has a repeat contrast scan at three months, a non-contrast at six and another 12 month time. She unfortunately did not attend any follow-up for um, ALT to monitor for arrhythmias of amiodarone. At this point, the, IC the ICC team um, really has a precious role, and I hand over to Liz. Thank you, Steffi. Um, and just to note, uh, when I first met uh, the patient, um, she was an inpatient um, following a, a second round of, a, of arrhythmias, I believe. And you can see that differential list was dwindling, um, but not definitive still in terms of what the underlying cause was. And this was a young, already traumatized patient because um, when I met her, it was her second time in hospital. And um, when I did meet her, I discussed um, her family history for which she knew little about. Um, and she was also very suspicious um, as to the questioning and the, the reasons behind it. So it was a very difficult, um, first meeting. Uh, we did talk about the potential uh, of this having an underlying genetic cause, but certainly that it was not definitive at that point in time. She did not feel comfortable with uh, discussing this with her family any further or for us to store DNA um, in preparation for potential genetic testing. It was clear that she was traumatised, but unfortunately, she also uh, did not want any psychological input at that point. And it was just a very quick reflective point before Steffi carries on um, in regards to when the right time is to start talking about potential genetic illness um, for patients, particularly without a definitive diagnosis, but where that risk is there. Thanks, Steffi. Thank you, Liz. This is the CMR at 12 months. Visually, the ventricle now looks a bit dilated. It, is, it was. Mass has remained the same, just to confirm that there was a relative LVH at the time from the edema. The LV function has only, hasn't changed really much. Ejection fraction is 39%. There is a relative thinning and apoacanesia at the basal inferoseptum and mid inferolateral wall more pronounced. 
Um, and V is non-dilated with a preserved function, not in general motion abnormalities, no pouches. Um, around the time of the MRI of note, troponin is normal. Tito mapping here quite uh, um, interesting, meaning that despite a year has gone by now, there is still evidence of a high T2 signal in terms of residual inflammation on, on an edema at this point, when we normally would expect the, the, the edema to resolve after six months, um, but the severity of the case was so much. Um, and here, the late announcement images, again, we see this uh, ring-like uh, um, pattern of subepicardial mid-wall LG from base to apical segments. The LG mass has reduced, but still very, very significant. Here was just to remember the initial presentation. Back to Liz. I'll keep it brief. Very much convincing of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy when discussed in the ICC MDT, which I'm sure we've convinced everybody of now. And it was just all about the challenges for this patient in regards to genetic testing, family screening, and a recommendation for uh, an internal cardiodefibrillator and ICD as well. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks. Perfect. So um, I think uh, probably the MRI, the last year, uh, one year, she was expecting an improvement in the heart and this didn't happen. So I think this was what um, convinced her in having genetic testing and gene testing showed a pathogenic frame shift variant in the desmoplakin gene predicting to cause a premature um, protein truncation leading to loss of function. As we've seen and with uh, interest um, uh, nicely heard uh, earlier, um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can present as a myocarditis. And we've seen that there's more plaque in carriers often present with chest pain and evidence of myocardial injury with um, cardiac enzyme movement and evidence of myocardial inflammation on imaging. And our lady did present a risk factor or astroponin, no flu like symptoms, and non sustained VT on arrhythmia and the ring pattern as described in the most recent paper on acute myocarditis associated with desmosomal gene variants. So in conclusion, this is the case of a young lady that presents with a very severe acute myocarditis. Um, in here, the trigger this was triggered by a diet pill containing multiple ingredients associated with physical exercise in someone with a positive genotype for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And again, this supports the concept that genotype positive individuals can remain phenotypically silent until a hit comes in. We do know about physical exercise as a possible hit, but in here certainly this diet pill is what caused such a severe severe um, phenotypic and uh, um, uh, pattern on MRI and clinical presentation. Thank you, and um, we can open for discussion. And sorry for the rushing. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and thank you, Lynn, also for, again, two fantastic cases. And that classic ring-like desmoplakin pattern is just so key. If you see that core mid-wall concentric LV, um, left ventricular mid-wall pattern of late enhancement, think desmoplakin, think DSP disease, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So fantastic cases.